Okay, how's it going everybody? I hope you're all doing well. Okay, so in this episode, I thought I'd try to say something about the, uh, about the Danish philosopher Kierkegaard, and in particular about one of his chapters from his very large work, Either Or, called The Diary of the Seducer. And uh, if you don't know, the diary is about a uh, Johannes, an aesthete, who through uh, careful manipulation seduces a younger 17-year-old girl called Cordelia until she uh, becomes drawn to him. Okay, so uh, let's just uh, jump right into it. Okay, so I said that Johannes is an aesthete. Well, what does that mean exactly? Well, as Kierkegaard conceives of it, the essential characteristics of the uh, aesthetic way of life are self-interest and pleasure. And uh, for Johannes in particular, it's a kind of um, it's a kind of cultivated reflective pleasure. More specifically, Johannes is a kind of connoisseur of seduction. I mean, this is what he does. He goes around detailing his uh, long drawn out manipulation and seduction of Cordelia, from which he gets great enjoyment at the expense of others. Okay, so now one important aspect of uh, Johannes's outlook on life is that fundamentally for him, what's interesting or um, what's exciting or boring takes precedent over what's good or bad or right or wrong. In other words, the value of aesthetic pleasure trumps all other values, moral or otherwise. Actually, another very famous account of this sort of view is given to us by, uh, by Oscar Wilde, and that's in his novel, The Picture of Dorian Gray, where he too expresses his belief that art, the aesthetic, should be, should be disassociated from moral considerations. Well, so it is with Johannes. He's all about the interesting life of enjoyment, which he takes to be much more important than the life of the ethical. In fact, ethical terms are usually just not part of an aesthete's vocabulary. Anyway, okay, so another very significant aspect of uh, Johannes' approach to life is that he views everything from an aesthetic distance. Most importantly, of course, Cordelia. In other words, he takes a disinterested view of her. Okay, now what does this mean to take, to take an aesthetic or disinterested view? Well, for Johannes, I think it means something like, like being distant or, or disconnected from what he contemplates or admires. That's to say, Johannes enjoys Cordelia but he does it from a, from a long way off, from the height of a crow's nest, as he puts it. He observes her and life in general from far off, extracting its pleasure while avoiding all of its uh, storms and attachments. He's essentially a passive observer. He's a voyeur. He plans his strategies and makes an inventory of all aspects of Cordelia, but all without real contact, connection, or uh, commitment. In fact, he goes so far away from reality that the pleasure that he experiences originates almost entirely from his own imagination. He's all about making things as compelling as he can for himself. He turns life into art. He recreates the world in his own image. Okay, now all this said, here's the thing. Kierkegaard thinks that there's something very deficient about this way of living. Actually, quite a few things, but, but let me just focus in on one. So one of the things that he suggests is that the aesthetic life is just too self-interested and detached and so won't yield genuine contact with another human being. Now, you might think, well, why is this a problem exactly? I mean, why would Johannes care about this? Well, here's the thing. Real love and commitment are important because, 
bound by, by duty and obligation, they force us away from living in a series of totally unconnected present moments. And instead, what they do is they place us in time, giving us a sense of life as a whole. I mean, think about it. That's what happens when we make a choice to commit to someone and make, a, make principled choices in general. All of a sudden, life acquires a long-term meaning or significance that it didn't have before. And it does this because we have to take our future with our loved one or our larger projects into account and be responsible for them. And this gives our life a purpose or a meaning that it didn't have before and couldn't have had when the only point before was basically just to uh, avoid boredom at all costs. Now, to commit yourself and to live with principles, this is what it means to move to what Kierkegaard calls the ethical stage of life. And this is one reason why living the purely aesthetic life often reveals itself as as empty and leads to despair. It leads to despair because you're just living fleetingly outside of time as a bundle of events without cohesion and without meaning and without a real sense of, uh, well, without a real sense of self. Okay, but I do think that there's another related issue here with uh, Johannes's and with the aesthetes way of life more generally. And it has something to do with their, their spending their time living on the periphery of life as a spectator and living in the imagination and not really engaging with the world. And you know, I wonder if uh, there's a deeper underlying explanation for this. Sure, Johannes and the aesthete would say that their distance and their, uh, their detached irony is deliberately chosen. It's simply about their, their carefully cultivated, artful approach to life, one designed to give them the, uh, the greatest pleasure and satisfaction. But, but I wonder if there's more to the story here. More specifically, I wonder if this, um, if this uncommitted way of living is a kind of symptom of some sort of deeper weakness or fear. You know, for, for some reason, the figure of, uh, of Socrates comes to mind here. And here I'm thinking in particular of uh, Plato's great dialogue, the Gorgias. Now, now be patient with me. I promise I'll, I'll make this make sense. So there's a section in there, in the Gorgias, where the very, uh, the very effectual and the very practical character, Callicles, admonishes Socrates and his philosophical way of life. He criticizes Socrates' constant uh, philosophizing. He wonders why, why Socrates spends all of his time doing philosophy, specifically spending his time squabbling in, in some corner with a bunch of others, often uh, humiliating them with his uh, petty logical skills. Why doesn't he actually get out in the real world, Callicles asks. Instead of talking, why doesn't he act? Take real action and, um, and be effectual. Ultimately, for, for Callicles, the life of philosophy is just, uh, as he says, just too plain, unmanly, and immature. Basically, too much philosophy and too much uh, chatter shows that one hasn't grown up yet. It shows that one isn't uh, strong enough to face the real world. In fact, Callicles says that philosophers like Socrates spend their time in hiding, avoiding the, the city centers because they're so ill-equipped to function properly. So ultimately, I guess what I'm saying is that Callicles is, uh, is skeptical of Socrates' motivations or intentions. In other words, maybe there's an impediment or a shortcoming that lies at the root of Socrates' push to philosophize. In fact, Callicles suggests that there is. Namely, there's a sickness or 
an anemia in Socrates, he says, and it's this that's causing him to turn to philosophy. If he were uh, healthy and strong, he'd leave all of that behind and just get out there and face the world and get on with life. Actually, you know what? Um, now this in turn makes me think of uh, how Socrates is viewed by, by Nietzsche. So Nietzsche, though he had some good things to say about him, was also very skeptical about Socrates and his uh, projects and intentions. That's to say, a little like Callicles, Nietzsche saw in Socrates' hyper-rationalization, in his uh, intellectualization, and in his constant chattiness and uh, continual arguing, a sign of weariness, a sign of sickness, as he says, a weakening of the instincts. In other words, Socrates, Nietzsche thought, was wary of life incompetent to deal with its hardships and its tragic nature. Like Callicles did, Nietzsche even called Socrates sick. Sick in the sense that he wasn't strong enough to face life. And so uh, what did Socrates do? Well, Nietzsche said that he compensated for his lack of vitality by using the only weapon he had, intellectualizing and theorizing about things. But all of this theorizing and abstracting and arguing, it's all just cold and distant and, well, anti-life. Well, okay, so why have I been talking about all of this? Well, here's the thing. I'm not saying it's exactly the same, but how both Callicles and Nietzsche view Socrates and his chattiness and his hyper-reflection, and his distance from life, and his fear of living in an engaged way, and facing life head-on, and so on, it all sounds a bit like Johannes, doesn't it? That's to say, in a way, it sounds a bit like the life of the aesthete. Could it be, then, that not unlike the Socrates that we get from Callicles and Nietzsche, there's also a kind of sickness or dissolution of the instincts that plagues the aesthete. And it's this that motivates their voyeurism and their detached irony and their spectator view of life and their lack of commitment. And you know, actually, here's something really interesting. Something mentioned by at least one commentator. So after Johannes's project of seduction, I don't think Kierkegaard makes clear whether or not Johannes ever consummates his relationship with Cordelia. Well, I don't know. Maybe that's because he didn't. Maybe it's because when it's all said and done, Johannes just couldn't seal the deal. Maybe at the heart of his project to elevate himself above others and to rise above life and its risks and to sophisticate and to manipulate and to wax poetic lies the most resentment producing and debilitating of all ailments, namely impotence. Bye for now. <laughs>